Good morning. I am so excited to be here. Me too. So normally I am not in this chair, and I don't get to interview anybody, so I'm really excited about this. Um, so Marco, uh, how many people here are familiar with Thumbtack? A good amount of people. Awesome. But there's some people who aren't. We should get them educated. Yeah, so I think that um, you know, you've kept a pretty relatively low profile over the years. For better and for worse. OK. Um, we've been at it a long time. You know, we've been at it for 10 years. And, and Thumbtack is in the business of helping you do more by making it easy to find pros to get anything done. And it's been a hard dream and one that we've worked on sort of over and over and over. But increasingly, we feel confident that we are the best way to do that. So you'll be hearing a lot more out of us over the coming months and years. Yeah, so I met Marco at a dinner. Um, so there were these pitch competition, like little salon dinners that I went to. I don't know, this is well over like this 10 is, years ago. This is 2010. OK, uh, well, 10 years ago. Um, and uh, I remember I'm very known for, for texting very, very short descriptions of businesses when I'm really excited about them to my husband. And so I messaged him, and I was like, open table for contractors. And he's like, yeah, that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and you nailed it, right? So like Open Table made it easy to find what restaurants had availability. And that same wasn't true for hiring plumbers, contractors, all the pros that you need. It's this huge array of professionals that are out there, millions of them, who have all this talent and often have free time. And yet it wasn't easily discoverable and easily um, sort of searched through by a customer. And that's yeah. what we tried to solve. So when I, when I met you, I, I, I feel like the company was just a few people. It was in like your house. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that really struck me that I loved was about you know, how you feed your employees. Yeah. And so Marco would cook for them. And um, it was just spectacular. And it became part of your culture. I even came later. Now you're a much bigger company. And you have, have an it. amazing kitchen. So, um, so can you explain a little bit about why that is so important to you? Yeah, I mean, look, the truth is it has humble and uh, practical roots, which is that we lived in a, an apartment that was far from any restaurants. And so it was just a pain in the ass to go get lunch. Um, and so we would start to go to Costco every couple weeks, get a bunch of food. And I was maybe either the most adept in the kitchen or the least adept anywhere else. Um, and so I then would often make food. And that scaled until we were probably like eight or nine people, at which point it started being too much. Um, and we brought in a friend of mine to be our um, chef to come in once a week and fill the fridge. And that became part of the culture because every meal we would sit together and talk and just convene and, you know, come from an Italian household where that's, that's where relationships get built. And it must be disappointing that San Francisco wants to get rid of kitchens. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> short-sighted. Th <laughs> thankfully, I think that one's not going to pass, but um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's important for us and a lot of other people. So when, when you started out, you were small and scrappy. You know, I remember when you were like scraping Craigslist mm -hmm. you know, to find contractors and, and, and uh, small businesses. And then you had what I think is pretty amazing explosive growth for a long period of time. What was that period like? Yeah, so this is really 2012 through 2017, 2018. And what had unlocked that is that we'd really discovered product market fit. You know, it took us three odd years to really get that right, to find the model where we could efficiently bring a customer and a pro together, and then just fuel it uh, by bringing more pros in, more customers in. And that took us to about 2017, where from the outside in, you looked at the company, and you're like, wow, the scale is a lot bigger, the revenue is a lot bigger. But internally, what we were seeing was the limits of that model, of that request for quote engine, and realizing that we were faced with this big decision of whether to sort of accept a diminished possibility or to reinvent ourselves to keep chasing that dream. Because you know, here we were, 2017, 2018, still nobody had cracked it. Nobody had become that go-to solution of find and hire a pro for whatever you needed. And we realized that our model was not going to be that. Um, and so over the course of the last couple years, we completely reinvented the product experience, moving from an asynchronous request for quote experience to now this search and booking driven experience that's dramatically better for our customers and pros. And that's why at the start I said, you're going to hear a lot more about us because now we have the answer. We have the ability to fulfill your every request and your every need. And as that gets richer and richer, we're going to get louder and louder. Well, this is called Startup Grind for a reason. So um, what? 
explain that whole process during that. Like, how did your company shift culturally? Yeah. How did employees handle this? Yep. Um, did you have to have, you know, let people go, hire different people? Like, how did that work? Yeah, it's a great question. So the why behind the decision was very clear to us, that the current model wasn't going to take us to where we wanted to go. The what do we do about it was a lot harder and is a lot harder to be sure about. And my biggest regret, actually, looking back on how we ran that process, is I'd wish I'd been more honest about the unknowns. Um, I think founders and CEOs often feel that they need to be the cheerleader in chief, the sort of optimist in chief. And there's an important part of the job that is that. Um, but at the same time, I think even more important, it's about being the realist. And there are times where reality is uncertain. And humans, I think, are most on edge when it comes to uncertain environments. And so it's much better to name it and say, hey, Cyan, we have a known problem. And to get to where we want, we have to fix it. I don't know how we're going to fix it. I don't know how long it's going to take. But I know that it's going to be the most important thing that we can do to accomplish our dreams. And if you're excited about that, let's go all in. But I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it's all going to be easy or OK. Mm -hmm. In fact, the thing I'm certain of is that it will be hard. Um, and I think having taken a more explicit tact, um, the people who were not right for that transition would have left, and it would have been easier. And the people who were truly determined and excited about that challenge, of which it was most of the folks, um, they would have been invigorated. Um, so setting expectations is a big lesson that I took from that. And you know, despite things being scary, um, if you hire great people, they are smart, and they will know. And you can't sort of just tack a message on on top to sort of make them feel good about it. You got to just speak the truth and tell them where things are at. So it's, it, I mean, it's super hyper competitive out there for talent, and especially when you're operating at scale and you, you reach this plateau. I can imagine that's got to be a scary time in the business. Absolutely. Yeah, so how many employees do you have now? There's a little over 800 of us. OK. Wow. Yeah, and you know, I think it, it's true that it's hyper competitive, but but what people want, I think, the, especially the very best people, one is a mission that they believe in. And something that Thumbtack has always had is a mission that we truly believe and live. It's about empowerment. It's about helping these pros uh, live their dreams, ultimately, and helping busy homeowners get more done. And that just feels good. Secondly, they want to be in a place where they can make a difference. And if it's just about making money, you should go work at Google and Facebook. They're there all day long, and like they'll hire, hire you. Go. Go do it. I but call it the retirement home. It's a great retirement home. Um, <laughs> you can coast uh, and you know enjoy yourself. But if you want to build something, if you want to be part of an adventure where you're creating the future, you have to take risk. There's no way to do that in a risk-free setting. And so having people who are excited about that um, is it's like self-selecting. If you're open about that, the people who want it come and, mm -hmm. and sort of participate in it. And if you want that retirement account, then you go elsewhere. So, you know, I, I'm going to imagine a lot of people in this audience. How many people here are founders or starting companies? Okay, that's a lot of people. Um, awesome. <laughs> I'm really, really excited for your journeys. Um, you know, what, what piece of advice could you give all of them, you know, uh, just because it is a grind and there's all, you know, there's times where there's highs and there's lows. Yeah. Like, what, what, you know, the highs are the addictive, and they're so fun, yep. and everything is great. But then when you get hit with your first problem, like real business problem, like what advice do you give them? So I think there's two things. I think the first thing is you have to be passionate about the problem you're solving, not the solution that you're building. So if it's simply that you love the intricacies of this sort of widget, tool, service application you're building, at some point, you're going to get bored. Or even worse, at some point, it's going to turn out to not be the right answer, and you have to build something else. Um, and I've seen a lot of people sort of lose stamina when that sort of tension comes. But if you're passionate about the problem you're solving and the impact that you're going to have, that carries you through a lot of ups and downs, because it's this North Star that's always true. Um, so I think first and foremost, like truly believing in the mission and the impact that you're having. The second thing I'd say is do it with people who are equally passionate. Because the beautiful thing about being a team is you're all sort of riding different waves. And so sometimes you're on a low, but your partner's on a high, and that balances you out. And 
if you're by yourself or not with people who are really in it with you as a true partner, it's going to be really hard when those lows are low and, and you have nobody to turn to. So, you know, it's a team sport for a reason. Teams, teams are stronger. Um, and the last thing, and, and I think maybe a little um, sort of nerdy, but I actually think a, co a tolerance for cognitive dissonance is a really important power of a founder. And what I mean by that is holding two opposing views in your mind at one time. So on one hand, I have always believed that there's an opportunity for us to be this category killer, to be this brand that people trust as the one and only way to hire pros. But every day, really all I think about is the flaws, the challenges, the risks, and sort of having both of those in mind at the same time is really useful because that confidence is really sustaining, but then the fear and the sort of like being totally paranoid is what makes your shit get better every day and makes it increasingly likely that you get there. Um, and so I think having that tolerance for holding those two opposing views is a really important feature for any founder. Awesome. And then quickly, you know, you did keep a low profile for so long. So, and I get conflicting, I even give conflicting advice on this. Is like, you know, at, at, in the early stages, you should be focusing on the business and not doing PR and all that sort of stuff. But you did keep your head down for so long. Um, yeah. when, I when is the right time? I don't know. Today? Uh, so uh, <laughs> part of me looks back and wishes we had started building really our sort of brand earlier. Um, and I think the thing that I didn't appreciate is brand building um, pays dividends over time. It really compounds. And it's not a one-time thing. You really have to invest in it like any other marketing channel and build equity in it. Um, and so it's certainly a mistake that, I, that we didn't start earlier. The flip side, though, and this goes to um, you know, the famous quote that you know, in the long run, the stock market is a scale. In the short run, it's more of a shouting match. And so it's, it's really like about heft and economic value that really matters in the long term. And if your head's down building that, um, that ultimately will, will carry out. And so, you know, we have, have had competitors over the years um, who had sort of spiked up in their profile and their recognition, but underneath they hadn't really built anything valuable, and so it petered out. So sort of the PR, or the marketing, the brand building can amplify something that's there and working and, and sort of of sustenance, but it can't be a substitute for that. Right. So um, you need both. Um, I wish we started a little bit earlier, but at the same time, if I had to choose between the two, I'm glad that really all of our time and energy and effort went to building this platform and building this engine because I know the power in that, um, and I know that it's going to compound for a long time, and people will come to know. Yeah, your customers know who you are. Yes. But you're not part of the, like the hype cycle, so I think you're like one of the most successful companies that the press doesn't talk about. Yeah, which so our really comms team may be uh, uh, annoyed with me about, but <laughs> I, they're working hard to fix. Awesome. Well, let's shift gears a little bit um, because there's a lot of people out here starting companies. You know, what is the future of technology for small business owners? So one thing that I think needs to be said more is technology isn't just a substitute for labor. It isn't just going to come at the expense of jobs. Um, there will be that. Automation is real. But at the same time, technology can empower labor can empower small business. And you see this trend that's happening, and I think people are realizing that small business is a giant industry. Um, you look at Shopify. I think it's the best example of this right now. They are serving, yeah, these, Ooh, hey. <laughs> yeah, these, these millions of merchants, helping them get set up with stores and create e-commerce presences. That's incredible. Um, and you know, it's a 50-odd billion dollar company now. Um, the world of sort of human talent is basically limitless in my mind, and technology is really just scratching the surface of helping that talent, be it a plumber, a caterer, or someone who is you know, building something and selling it on Etsy or through their store on Shopify. Um, we are just at the start of technology continuing to empower these people, and my goal, and this is obviously with, with respect to Thumbtack, but if you're a talented professional, that should be all it takes to build a successful business.
being an online marketer shouldn't matter to being a great plumber. Being great at customer relationship management and keeping track of your operations shouldn't get in the way of delivering a great service. We, as technology builders and technology providers, can do a lot of that for you. We can make it intuitive and easy, and as part of that, the people with the talent can spend more of their time serving their customers, living their own dreams, um, and I think we make the world a richer and better place. And there's a lot of opportunity there. I don't think all the problems are even nearly solved. There are still businesses that are run off spreadsheets and text messages and, and things like that. Yeah, it is uh, both heartbreaking and then also motivating to see how much opportunity there still is, how much analog interaction there is, how much sort of back office tools is a notebook and a pen or a spreadsheet with a list of names and emails. Um, all of these things will have tools and services built around them. And ultimately, that's about empowerment. It's helping these entrepreneurs, these creators, um, these service professionals do more. Um, they have that talent, they have that hustle, but they don't always have the orthogonal skills around marketing or operations that typically today hold them back. Um, so I think it is, it's beautiful because it, it builds a great business, but it also empowers more business owners to, to live their own dreams. And you know, if you look at the United States right now, new business formation and entrepreneurship is at multi-decade lows. Um, it's a real risk for our economy and our country that um, entrepreneurs aren't sort of starting things. And I don't mean that just in the tech sense, I mean that in the broad sense of starting a coffee shop, starting a plumbing business, all the things that sort of are the engine of this economy, uh, we need more of. Yeah, and I think a lot of people look at these sort of problems um, and it's enticing to go sort of like making web apps and consumer apps, you know, direct to consumer. But like when you're actually making like a SaaS product or a product for the small business owner, a lot of people say, well, it's just really unsexy and not fun and all of these things. But like it can be extraordinarily fun, especially when you change someone's life and they're suddenly making meaningful income. Oh, so. Don't get into the small business sector for the sex, sex appeal. Uh, <laughs> you won't find it there. What you will find is so many great people who are working hard to live their dreams. And when you participate in that and provide the spark or the new customer or the tool that lets them get further than they thought possible, they love you for it. And they love the partnership that comes from that. And it is sort of an intoxicating feeling to be able to talk to these pros and realize that you know we played a small part in them realizing their dreams. Yeah, definitely. This is a recurring theme. One of the reasons why I love Thumbtack in the very beginning is I invest in companies that do this, and um, like Uber, Postmates, etc. Um, you know, I think you know one of the things that I think is an opportunity here. The number one thing that I hear small business owners what they need is access to capital. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can raise venture capital, yep. you know, we can also get debt, you know, but some of their options are only credit cards and yep. things that, are, you know, have very, very high interest rates. Like, what do you think about what the opportunities that are there? Yeah, so I think the, the, the number two things we hear from our small businesses, number one, find me new customers, find me more customers, which is really revenue, mm -hmm. helping them grow. And the second is capital to serve that revenue and to grow into that opportunity. Um, I think what you see is more and more um, finance is not something that is a separate thing where you go to the bank and ask them for a loan. Increasingly, it's being built into these platforms as a feature, as a product. Um, look at what Shopify has done. You know, they, they, they talked about this morning uh, in one day giving a $200 loan and a million dollar loan to different businesses. And it's sort of natively built in. Um, we have aspirations of helping our pros access capital through the platform. And I think more and more as these workflows get digitized, as these marketplaces replace analog interactions, platforms then have the, the purview and the perspective to be able to offer capital in a very seamless and uh, economically efficient way because we know, wow, Cyan is a great pro on the platform. She delivers great service. She's growing. She's coming to us saying, hey, I need to, to buy another truck and buy more tools. Great, we can give her that loan and that we know that it'll pay back. Um, so I think increasingly finance will just be one more product or feature of these platforms that are really about fueling growth. And it won't be something that feels like, oh, I got to go to the bank or the financial institution to do that. It's just going to seep in everywhere. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. I think um, our time is about up. I don't know if you want to give one motivational 
thing to the audience, like to get them excited, but. Yeah, so last thing I'll say is I think entrepreneurs uh, are about expanding the scope of the possible. Um, and I see that on our platform with our pros, but I also see it when I meet all of you as entrepreneurs. And I think that's what uh, fuels our economy and, and makes our future prosperity possible. So thank you for doing what you're doing yeah. and keep up the grind. Thank you, everyone.